Belief can be a powerful force. No one knows that better than the people who are sure they've seen Bigfoot. Sometimes I still can't believe that we saw what we saw. About seven feet tall, making a sound like a pig squealing or a woman screaming. And walking like a man, but looking more like a gorilla. He looked like he had six fingers on each hand. I come out here and rough talk him and run him off. And I said, get away from here. Get. Get. Good morning. You get one more week to enjoy that video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. No. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, just want to say welcome to everybody who's here. If you may be visiting, we do not do that every week. So <laughs> say hello to those of you on Jasper campus and those of you on Logoti campus. This is a really a special day today, not because it's my birthday, but because I don't know if you realize this or not, but 17 years ago today, the Redemption Christian Church began. We, were, we are 17 today as a church and uh, that is exciting, and it is incredible, really, to think about. It was 17 years ago, exactly to the day, that I stood in a meeting room at the Days Inn uh, oh, here in Jasper, Indiana, and we preached the first sermon there and had the first service and had a, a handful of people who said they, they would uh, be with us to call this their home. And it's been a great experience. And I got to admit, when I preached that day, I never would have ever, ever dreamed uh, that God was going to do what he's... I knew he's going to do something cool. But to think that there would be over uh, 2,000 people who called Redemption their church home, to think that we would have uh, locations in more than one place, and that the lives would be impacted that have been impacted, that, that the lives have been changed, and the influence that we've been able to have, the impact for Jesus around our region and also around the world through, through the missions that we're able to support. It's just absolutely an incredible thing, and I just love it so much. But I know that it's been a great 17 years, but I also know and believe with all my heart that there's going to be far more, if the Lord tarries, if, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, there's going to be far greater things to come. Because He's going to continue, as we love God and as we love people, He's going to continue to change the world. And we're going to be standing together another 17 years from now, and we're going to be celebrating everything that God's done. And so I hope you feel as good about being a part of this as I do. I thank God every day that I get to work here that I get to be a part of this ministry. I mean, it's just incredible that I get to be a part of this ministry with you all and on this journey together. And so uh, I just thank you again for letting me be uh, one of your ministers here and be a part of it. And I just pray you feel a blessing as well. Before we jump right into the message, I do want to take one more moment to just encourage you, implore you, to beg you to come on out next week, I know it's a busy weekend, and bring people with you. Rick Ashley, who is absolutely my hero in preaching, is going to be here to bring a powerful message, and you will not want to miss it. You will not want to regret it. Uh, you will regret if you miss it. You, it's not one of those that you just want to catch online later. You want to be a part of the worship service. It's going to be special, and so I want to encourage you to come on out for that. Okay, if you have your Bibles or uh, a phone or device, go to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. If you don't have a, a device or, or a Bible with you, then go ahead and grab a church Bible out of the chair on the table up top. Open it up to page uh, 387. Uh, page 387, and we're going to jump right in there with a verse that probably some of you have heard. But uh, in this series, uh, Urban Legends, Spiritual Myths, uh, that people believe. We've been looking at some of the spiritual myths that just get passed on uh, from time to time that people believe are in the Bible that are not actually in the Bible. We're not actually 
talking about Bigfoot and Loch Ness monsters. We're talking about spiritual urban legends. And here's the deal. There are some innocent spiritual urban legends, but there are many, and some of them that we've talked about, that are quite harmful and devastating when believed. And so they cause all kinds of confusion and problems. And I believe today's is one of those. In his book, Ten Smart, uh, or Ten Dumb Things That Smart Christians Believe, Larry Osborne, a pastor, tells a story about two different couples. The first couple is named Don and Sharon. They have three grown sons. One of their sons is doing really well in life. He's a model citizen. He has a great job, a strong marriage. He has a vibrant walk with the Lord. The other two sons, well, they're kind of a mess. They're really a mess. One of them is big time a mess. He's in jail. Um, he's pushing 40. It still hasn't found himself. He, he's been on job number 15 and, and wife number who knows what. And it gets worse. He's developed a disdain for the spiritual things. He's developed a dependence on alcohol. He's just going the wrong way. And he wants nothing to do with his parents. He truly does not come to them. He doesn't keep contact with them. Unless, of course, he needs something. And then conveniently, he, he finds them then. Now, while Don and Sharon have this pride in their son who's serving God and, and being a model citizen, they have this emotion of anger and frustration and embarrassment and shame. And most of all, their biggest struggle is guilt over their prodigal sons. They feel as if they have failed as parents because surely if they raised their kids in the Lord, surely if they have a God, had a godly home, a godly enough home, their kids would be godly, right? And some of their friends agree because you know how it is. They would never say it out loud, but they say it to each other. They, they blame Don and Sharon. The second couple is Mike and Rhonda. Now, they feel no guilt or no shame for their child. They raised their daughter. They tried to raise their daughter in their Lord, and they did everything they could. But when she went off to college, uh, they modeled a genuine faith home and all that. She went off to college, and she just went off the rails. They took her to Sunday school. They took her to church. They gave her Christian-based education. They gave her all the guidance. But in college, she just kind of went wild, and she's not come back. And she's, she's just always uh, in trouble. She dropped out of school. She moved in with her boyfriend. She wants nothing to do with Christ, and she's just going the wrong path. But yet they are calm, and they don't feel this guilt because they believe that God has promised them that if they raise their kid in the Lord, then he will come back or she will come back in this case. And oh yes, they're disappointed with some of the decisions she's made, but they just have this trust and this promise. Both couples have this situation. One of them is shame and guilt. The other is this hope. But surprisingly, both of their situations are based on the same flawed assumption. And it's the spiritual myth for today. It is a godly home guarantees godly kids. That's just not true. I mean, we know it's not even true scripturally. It's not true pragmatically. When I look out in life, we don't see that as true. And, and yes, we strive to raise our kids in the Lord, and we know that we've got to do the best we can. But to believe this myth that a godly home guarantees godly kids is just not true. So where in the world does this myth come from? Why do people believe this? Well, I believe this comes in at least part or a large part from a verse that many of you probably heard and maybe you even know and could recite it by heart. It's Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Listen to what it says. Direct your children unto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Direct your children in the right path, and when they are older, they, they will not leave it. Start your children off on the way to go, and they will not leave it. If it uh, the ESV version says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
Maybe you've heard this verse. Maybe you've held on to this verse. And many people take this verse as a promise of God that if you raise your kids in a godly home, then they will certainly be godly. Or if they leave, they will come back to it. But is that what this verse says? Is that what the promise of God is? Is that what they're saying? In fact, how did it get from they will not leave it till they will come back? What does this verse say? Now to understand a little bit about this verse, I want to give you just a little bit of teaching today about how the division of the Bible is, how it's divided up. Jewish scholars for years had divided the Old Testament into several different categories, several different genres, and you need to understand what Proverbs really is before you start looking at it this way. First of all, there's the books of law in the Old Testament. The first five books of the Old Testament are the Pentateuch, the books of the law, and that's all the thus saith the Lord. That's the Ten Commandments and all the Levitical law, the moral and dietary law that the people of God followed in the Old Testament, and many of which are important for us today, obviously. And then you have the books of history, Joshua and Judges, that describe the people of Israel's history during that particular time period and other books, and so you have that division. And then you have the book of prophets, and that's even divided up into different kinds of prophecy. There's minor prophets and major prophets. And so you have those prophets, and they describe prophecy during a specific time of the people of Israel. And finally, we have another division, another genre that's called wisdom literature. Wisdom literature, which is a different animal altogether. Wisdom literature literature is God-guided observations about life and wisdom about life and wisdom literature includes the psalms and job and ecclesiastes and song of solomon and proverbs a lot of these wisdom literature books come in sayings they come in poetry they come in stories that are giving wisdom for life how to love god and have a relationship with him and how to love one another wisdom literature offers lots of great advice the book of proverbs offers god inspired wisdom for life and here's the thing it was originally written to the jewish people to adolescent men and the goal was to teach the importance of this reverence and respect in all of god and and to give them the traits they needed to survive and to thrive in this world A common theme throughout the book of Proverbs in particular is this. Two roads are there. There are two roads that have two very different destinations. There's a road that leads to fulfillment and following the ways of God, and there's a road that leads to destruction and suffering and death. There are two roads to travel. And Proverbs is trying to guide you to the right road. And those general observations are usually true, or often true, but not always. They are inspired uh, observations, but they're far from universal. Because the righteous aren't always honored. The wicked is sometimes, uh, the wicked sometimes succeeds. Sometimes lazy, strike it rich. So what I'm trying to say to you is Proverbs is wisdom literature and this verse is wisdom literature. And in other words, Proverbs 22.6 is a principle, not a promise. Do you understand the difference? A principle is different than a promise. When God gives a promise in Scripture, you can take it to the bank. The deal is done. It's signed. And God gives lots of promises in Scripture that we can hold on to. But he also gives us principles. Now, what's the difference in a principle and a promise? Well, for example, if I say this to you, if I say this to young people, I say, listen, if you eat right and you exercise and you avoid smoking and uh, avoid uh, abusing substances, you're going to live a healthier and a longer life. That's a good principle that is often true right but it's not a promise we all know people who've done all those things and who've died young due to some unforeseen circumstances or if we say to to people hey listen you need to work hard save your money and don't go into major debt if you do that you're going to have financial peace and stability later on and that's often true as a general rule But we know that circumstances happen, right? The stock market can crash. You can lose your job. You can have health problems that cause you financial problems. It's a principle, but you would never see me saying that as a promise. 
So the first part of this says, listen, train up your child in the way they should go, the way they should go, and, and they will not depart from it. That is a principle to be applied, and it is often true, but it is far from a promise. And when you believe it as a promise, instead of wisdom literature, some really unhealthy things will happen. For example, it causes unwarranted guilt. Unwarranted guilt happens when we believe this. You, you, you have parents who are riddled with guilt. They've raised their kids. I have some good friends who raised their kids in the Lord, and most of the kids are following the Lord, but they have some that aren't, and they raised the kids the same way. They loved them the same way. They were consistent, yet something happened with some of them and others, and it, you can't blame the parents. They have this unwarranted, Don and Sharon in our story, had this unwarranted guilt. Because you've got to understand something. It isn't always their fault, but society sometimes looks at it that way. I have to tell you, I have been in a public place and seen a kid misbehaving and acting out, and what have I often did? What's my first thought? It's judgment, isn't it? Like, they should do something about that. My kid will never act like that. And this was especially true before I had kids, right? Because I knew everything about parenting before I had kids. I mean, I would judge you left and right before I had kids about how you raise your kid. And then I have kids and I realize, oh, I don't really know anything about this. <laughs> Folks, when your child rebels, or when your child doesn't follow God, it is not always, and not even often, I would say, a result of your bad parenting. We are born with a sinful nature inside of us. And you can blame your spouse for it, and you can blame your ex for it, but we are all sinners who need grace. We all fall short of the glory of God. Sin happens. Life happens. And you could have the most perfect conditions that you could ever dream of, and you could do everything close to right. Now, you're never going to be a perfect parent, but close to right and still have children rebel. You know how I know that? Let me tell you how I know that. It's called the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve had perfect conditions, everything just as it should have been. They had a perfect, lovingly father who loved them, walked with them, encouraged with them, and yet they chose disobedience. They chose to rebel anyway because we have a sinful nature. And God gave us free will. And sometimes in free will, we will turn away from God. And it's not the parent's fault or it's not the choice's fault that you made's fault, it's up to each individual. We are responsible for our own sins. Another reason this myth is so unhealthy, though, is because it can cause some foolish pride. The opposite of this guilt is foolish pride. We can start to think if our kids turn out all right, then, man, we must be doing something really, really good. And I don't want to minimize godly parenting, but I want to tell you, sometimes you just got to thank the grace of God that your kids turned out like they did. We can't have pride in it. It wasn't us. And besides that, say your kids are doing really good. Guess what? The jury's still out. Do you realize that? I mean, we've all seen kids who, who maybe started off on the right path and wondered, I can point to you, a, a gentleman I know who was a missionary, lived on foreign mission fields, preached in a church. He loved God and loved people and left his wife of 50 years. Left the church and is now far from God. See, the jury was still out. I can also tell you plenty of people who started off rebellious and wild and nuts and crazy and you thought, boy, they're lucky they'll be alive. And now they're changing the world and serving God in mighty, mighty ways in fact if you're an educator you know that sometimes it's those children who call her outside the lines who you have a hard time keeping straight they end up being so creative and doing something dramatic and great in life with the gifts god has given them so don't have foolish pride if your kids turned out okay and don't have unwarranted guilt if they don't there's one final thing, though, that I think is an unhealthy result of this. It's, it's called unreasonable anger with God. We, we start to blame God because we say, you've promised they would come back, and that's just not true. I have buried children, adult children, uh, of people who raised their kids in the Lord. They went away, and they never come back, and something tragic happened. Now, what if those, those people believe this myth 
as a promise to God. They're going to be angry with God about a promise he never made to start with. We get angry with God for not keeping promises he never made to begin with. And so we need to be careful not making a principle a promise. And there's some unhealthy results. Now, I say all that to say, don't lose hope if your kid's wandering. Don't lose hope if, if things aren't going the way they are because I, I believe so much in the power of God and how he changes lives. And here's what you need to know. Godly parenting still matters. The odds of your kids following Christ when you raise them in a godly way, in a godly home, are dramatic. They're great. And that's why the, the majority of the time when you do that, your kids end up following Jesus. I believe the odds are great for them to be followers if you are a follower and if you lead them towards following. That's why Scripture commands us as parents to train our kids up. It commands us to, to pass on the spiritual torch to the next generation. Way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, it says, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you, when you are going to bed, and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on the gates. What's this saying? It's saying, listen, the word of God, put it in your heart, put it everywhere. Talk about it with your kids when you're driving down the road, when you're going to bed, when every chance you get to pour in them about God's way, you do it. You do it. And the New Testament continues this thought of passing the spiritual truth torch when Paul says this to the Ephesians fathers do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord he's given some really sound advice bring them up he says listen don't browbeat them don't think that rules make a, a relationship with God they don't rules are important guardrails are important but they won't make it alone but at the same time don't just let them run you teach them you put guardrails in place he's saying give them the careful instruction of the Lord I've heard it said that rules without a relationship equal rebellion a relationship without rules equal chaos but it's only when you put rules in the relationship together that good things can happen so it's important to be a godly parent it's important to be as faithful as you can but the reality is that's all you can do god doesn't call you to the results he calls you to be faithful to the process so since godly homes matter since godly parenting matters I just want to give you some principles here as we bring this message to a close that I think are universal from Scripture that can help you along this process. The first one is this. If you are going to have a godly home, then you've got to pray all the time. Pray all the time. I'm telling you, there is power in prayer. Paul, Paul talks about praying without ceasing. He means all the time. It means as you're going, you, you set up times to pray, and you pray as you're going. You just pray, and you pray, and you pray. I'm telling you, parenting is a big deal. It's tough. And prayer is a survival tool. Godly parenting is important, and it's un attainable without prayer the book of james says uh, the prayer of a righteous person has the power to produce wonderful results i'm telling you prayer is powerful i believe in the power of prayer because it increases god's presence in your lives it it it, it, it shows a dependence on god you're saying i cannot do this on my own there's no way i can do this i need you lord and that's what prayer does and I want to challenge you to pray for your kids. Pray with your kids. Pray with them at night. Pray with them over the morning. Uh, one of the things I do at night when I pray with my kids, uh, Ivan Stubbs, our, our pastoral counselor, he gave me this really neat tool. He gave me a, a list of papers that had descriptors on there, some adjectives and, 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 and adverbs that described uh, different things. And he said, here's what you do. He said, I, I've, I've done this myself and I've passed on to others and it's powerful. You go through there and you pick out ones that, that describe your children. 
And when you're praying at night, you include those. You thank God for those. So for example, if I'm praying for my daughter Olivia, I might say, Lord, I thank you for, for her creativity and for, for her, her study skills and how smart she is. And, and, and I say those things. And she, not only am I talking to God, but she hears those things. And I say to my son, you know, I say when I'm praying with my son, Lord, thank you for his energy and for his passion. And I thank you for his sense of humor. And I say those things and I pick out different ones at different times and they hear them. And sometimes they even ask me about them. Because I'll tell you what, what you believe the most important in person in your life believes about you goes a long way to what you believe about yourself. You understand what I'm saying? What you feel the most important person in your life believes about you goes a long way to what you believe about yourself. So if your children and your grandchildren and, and the people you come into contact with that, that believe in you, that believe you, that, that want to know what you think about them, they believe you think these things about them, it starts to become a reality in their lives. Prayer is essential. There's something else, though. If we're going to have a godly home and raise our kids in a godly home, we've got to live a consistent and authentic life. I have so many people, and I'm not trying to be judged here, but I have so many people who curse and yell and scream and act bad about people when they're around their kids and, and they're on the job, and then they expect the children to believe the faith that they claim they proclaim they live. And listen, none of us are going to be perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But don't use that as an excuse not to grow more like Christ, not to be a better example for Christ. If you're still doing the same thing, if you still have the same temper that you had when you came to Christ, something is wrong in your walk with Christ. And your kids will see it, and they can pick out a respectable fraud quicker than anybody. They can. If you hold grudges... If you're gripey, if you're dishonest, I mean, if you're calling into work and saying, hey, I'm sick and you're really going to play golf, don't be surprised when your kids lie to you about things. When you're talking down to your spouse or you're complaining about someone at church, don't be surprised when your kids don't want anything to do with the faith you say you have. I want you to know something, folks. While faith is taught, it's more caught than it's taught. I mean, all of us who are parents have seen our kids picking up bad habits that we have, and we feel bad about them when we see them in somebody else. I want to tell you, your kids need to see you living a consistent life. They need to see you living an authentic life, which means you're honest and repentant when you mess up, and you let them know you're not perfect. But you don't use that as an excuse not to grow in him integrity matters character matters when kids see you and the old adage don't do what i do do what i say does not work i have a friend who preaches at one of the largest churches uh, christian churches in the country one of the largest churches period he's well known all across the country he's wrote books he's traveled he stands before over 20,000 people and preaches each week. But you know what I'm most impressed about this guy? I know his kids. And you know what they say? They say something that I hope and pray my kids can say. My dad is the same guy at home with us as he is when he's standing up in that pulpit and preaching. When your kids see that kind of consistency and that authenticity, they will want it. They will hunger after it, oftentimes. When they see you love people, when they see you experience love as a verb, love doing, when they see you extending grace, when they see you giving grace, when they see you faithfully committed to the worship of Christ and coming to church where it's not just something you do when it's convenient, when they see it is an important part of your life, it will have an impact. And let me just take a second to address the dads in this room. And why am I picking you out? Because I, I, statistics don't lie. There is something so powerful and, and truthful about when the man is a spiritual leader and example in the house, the impact that it has. 
your importance. And I thank God for godly women who've carried the torch and continue to do so. But it is your responsibility because you have such an impact. Um, there was a few years ago three studies done that have overwhelming results. And I want you to listen to these real closely. If a child in a house is the first one to become a Christian, there is a 3.5% probability that everyone in the house will become a Christian. If a mother is the first person to become a Christian in the house, there is a 17% probability that everyone in the household will follow. But if the father is the first one to become a Christian, listen to this. There is a 93% probability that everyone in the house will follow. Now, men, if that doesn't put a lump in your throat, I don't know what will. That is how important you being a spiritual leader is. And it's time to step it up if you're not and be that person. And that's why we are so we even do things to track men around here and so heavily because it's so important for the rest of the family. It's so important. So live consistently. Make God's word a priority. Strive to discipline and set boundaries and to love and to be the best parent you can. And that brings me to the last bit of advice I can give you. And that's that you need to practice grace regularly. And should I say liberally? If you want your kids to be Christ followers, they need to see you living out in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that none of us deserve what we get. None of us have earned it. None of us have gained our way to heaven. None of us have a right standing before God on our own. It's through Jesus that we have a right standing. It's through the grace of God given to us. Undeserved riches, undeserved forgiveness, undeserved rewards that comes through God just giving us unconditional love and grace. And they need to not only see you doing that to others, you need to do that to them. That doesn't mean you condone their sin. That doesn't mean you say it's okay. But you love them unconditionally anyway. You never give up loving them. You never stop. You keep loving them until the very last breath that you have because you know that the best way to show them God is to model the grace of God. And he's been so graceful to you and so graceful to me. And we have to pass it over. Grace covers a multitude of sins. Folks, parenting doesn't come with a guidebook. It's not a formula. It's a faith. And it's trusting God. And it's understanding that sometimes your kids will make the right choices. And sometimes they won't. But when you stand before God, what He wants is faithfulness. And you leave the results to Him and to them. So just keep trying. Keep praying. Keep pressing on. And you be the best example of Christ you can to them. And I would say more often than not, they'll come to Him. But no matter what, we just keep trusting and loving God who's given us so much. He's the perfect Father. Let's pray. Father God, I'm sure in a church this size, there are many people who are struggling with this. Some are struggling because their kids are far from God and they don't know if they'll ever come back. But they just keep trusting in you and trying. Lord, help them remove the guilt. I mean, certainly we've all made mistakes. Certainly there's been broken families and people make selfish decisions that's caused their kids to stumble. I, that happens, and, and we realize that. But more often than not, people are far from you just because they've made their own choice. And even if we have really royally screwed up, your grace covers us, and before you we stand forgiven. And that's all we can do. And we're thankful for that. So would you just give them a peace of knowing, of knowing that your grace covers them? And would you be with their wayward child? Lord, would you call them back? Would they be a prodigal who comes home? And Lord, for all of us who are raising young children now, would you guide us and direct us to do the best that we can? 
to love you, to love people, to love our kids, to demonstrate your, your walk. And Lord, just know that it'll have an impact. And Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity that you have stewarded us. You've blessed us with the opportunity to, to, to raise and to impact people who are made in your image, created in your image. And may we just do the best we can. And Lord, when we fall short of your glory, may we trust in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus and your grace. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Lost at the fall Running away would not hear you call But Father you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father you love me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation Destined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace your home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost but Jesus your face was said so I worked my fingers down to the bone but nothing I did could ever atone but Jesus you paid my debt amen by your blood I Redemption and salvation Lord you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night The Spirit you made me see And I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, this heart made of stone The Spirit you moved in me At your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened on my dark and heart, the light of Christ has shown. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven said, I said, by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand, so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. Shout it out, church. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone.